Hello everyone, welcome to our Malaysian Nature Society Nature Grapher channel. In this episode, we have with us Miss Pasupati. She has been an eco warrior for approximately 30 years. She has been a um, principal, headmistress for two national schools, and then also a volunteer with MNS. And in her retirement, she still a uh, volunteer uh, to school underprivileged. Miss Pasu has also been our chairperson of the Malaysian Nature Society Slango branch. This morning, Miss Pasu will share with us her experience through the journey of uh, conservation and also um, tell us or share with us how you can make a better tomorrow for all of us. Miss Pasu? Thank you, Josh, for introducing me. My journey has been a very long one, and I should think that it started when I was a little kid who got a new bicycle. We were living in Kulim where I started schooling. My mother uh, recalls that I used to disappear time and time again with my bicycle, exploring that whole area. It was very safe those days. And very soon, in my, in my uh, journeys around, I was able to find interesting places like a stream. My mother used to pack a basket of food and we would all go, you know, I would cycle and uh, they, they would all be following. Very soon, the neighbors started joining us and it became a, a usual weekend thing. So that's how my interest in nature started. I started schooling at St. Anne's Convent, mostly run by Catholic nuns. Not only did they teach us how to read and write, but they went further than that. They looked after us and made sure we got our exercises. And at least once a year, they would cut a whole bunch of kids, maybe standard one, standard two, standard three, in a bus and take us all the way to Tanjung Bunga Penang, a long way for us, where the nuns had a little bungalow by the beach. For many of us, it was the first time at the sea. And this type of exercises and activities continued class after class and we became very familiar with different environments. I continued my education uh, in Penang Free School, the only Indian girl in the whole school. It's a boys school but they allowed girls to come in just for Form 6. I remember my geography teacher who always used to dress in white he was teaching us about the beach, the waves, and about the different features. And for the first time in my life, I learned a lot more about the formation of sand spits. Yeah. I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, wait by the roadside uh, near my house for the bus that will come about 5.45 a.m. And when I reached Butterworth, I would have to wait for the ferry, cross the channel. And on the other side, I would have to join a long queue of students waiting to reach their schools. And by the time I arrived at the gate of Penang Free School, the prefects will tell me, you are lit. <laughs> you are lit. It happened so many times. I don't know how many minus points they had given me until I decided I had enough. I walked into the principal's office and I said, I get up at five o'clock, I come here and I'm outside the gate. What can I do? And he said, okay, for you special, we won't, we won't uh, penalize you. Nice. And so I became a very good friend of the principal. And indeed, I, I managed to meet him a couple of years back after so long. When I started work as a graduate teacher, I came across an advertisement in the newspapers 
where Shell Company offered to sponsor one girl to the Outward Bound School in Lumut. I quickly phoned and I, got the, and I got the sponsorship. And that became the starting point of what life is like in the outdoors. Not only did I learn how to do hiking safely, we did abseiling, we learned how to canoe and canoe across the channel and how to sail a tongkang, a big boat. We learned a lot to survive uh, without many facilities. And we learned a lot because the warden and his assistants were all guys, but they looked after all of us very well. And I still remember how strict they were and I remember having to clean toilets every morning. That was a real lesson that has lasted me a lifetime. It made me very hardy. And uh, to tell myself that whatever I wanted, it was up to me. I just have to tell myself, like the dance taught me, I can and I will. And I decided I was going to make a change. I was the first one in my extended family to go to university. My maternal grandfather ran away from Madras when he was 14 years old and hid inside one of the two ships that sailed between Madras and uh, Penang. Luckily, they didn't throw him into the sea. I don't know how long it took him. It took the boat to come to reach Penang. Uh, for a 14-year-old, mingled with an Indian community in Batukawan, and when he was old enough, he went up the hill behind the settlement, built a, bit, built a wooden house, built a well, and started growing spice trees and durian trees. And he married one of the ladies from that community. My mother never went to school. But she was very knowledgeable about the environment. After my father married my mother, he was conscripted by the Japanese to work on the Death Railway. And if you know history, the Death Railway was the railway link between Malaya, Thailand, Burma into India. So my father was stuck there for months after his wedding. He got sick, he had lots of sores, everything. But by the end of 1945, the war came to an end and he came back and I was born. That was mm. my family side on my mother's side. But one day, uh, up there on the hill, when, they, when my grandfather was doing very well selling fruits and spices, pirates came along, attacked him and, and, uh, and, and uh, the family. Fortunately, he had all his parangs ready. There, there was a fight, I'm told, and he managed to slash a few, probably killed one or two, got his son and the daughter and the wife, and they ran down to the lowland and never, never went back to that place because it was too dangerous. Yeah. So that was a very interesting story. I never knew until that point. Only after I, I finished uh, university, I got the story. Then I started digging up. What about my father's side? This was even more interesting. My grandfather was a cripple polio victim. Right hand, right leg, hardly moved. But he was running a business, a flower shop in Nibong Tabal, right? He married my grandmother when she was eight years old. So Can you imagine that? Child marriage. Child marriage, eight days. years old. <laughs> and when I pursued the matter, 
oh, then I, I was told, until she reached puberty, she had to stay with her own parents. And then he, they, they became, they, they lived as husband and wife, and they produced 10 children. Oh, that's a big family. Right. <laughs> Living only on jasmine flowers from plants that they grew in a big area, you know, whose area it was, I don't know, but they survived a big family. And my father went to the English school. Okay. So I'm beginning to wonder, how come I have all these instincts about wanting to explore places, want to be, want to be in the outdoors, want to be among trees? I'm happiest in the forest. Is it heredity or environment? Of course, Outward Bound School uh, equipped me with a lot of skills. But the other things, sense of adventure has never left me. And I have always been able to share things about nature with anybody and everybody, be it groups of students or be it grand, small children. And I love taking children into the forest. So, I am beginning to wonder whether I inherited my, paternal, uh, my maternal grandfather's spirit of adventure of running away from home. And that actually affected me because I felt that my family with six children and the parents could not survive on my father's pension. I was also affected by many inspiring models. Angela Hijas was the first one who decided that we needed some other uh, SIG besides the Pathfinders for people who were not really able to do all the hardcore climbing. And once she started it, that was the beginning of my interest to develop myself and my skills. And that is how I got involved with uh, trekking, producing trails, marking trails, and taking people through those trails. Being a nature guide meant that we should know a lot about anything and everything between the sky and the sea. A very big demand. So I decided I would pick up birding by following some enthusiasts. Sui Seng and his team were very good and I also went through birding courses. To learn about flora and fauna, I followed Uncle Fu, the late Uncle Fu, who was like a, like a dictionary. He could name any plant anywhere. And another important factor that I also learned from the previous chairman, Mr. Henry Gore, is how to deal with conservation issues. For the first time, Slango Branch took up a case against the government because the project meant they were going to go through the Quartz Ridge. I live near the Quartz Ridge and I can see the Quartz Ridge every day. How could we allow them to go blast through this very interesting and very expensive terrain? Slangwa Branch took up the case together with um, Trees and Pekka, but finally we lost because the company that was in charge took up a counter case against us. And because we didn't have the money to put down 57.2 million before we could discuss with them, we surrendered. So that was a lot of learning over many years. So 19 years since retirement, but your retirement seems it's not a retirement because as I know, you are now schooling uh, uh, underprivileged uh, children. Can you tell us about how you in inculcate um, any elements of nature into your yes. teaching? 
it was fortunate that I got into this place uh, because they needed an English teacher. And I was on a break from Sunway University. And I decided, okay, let me try. And once I went in, I felt comfortable enough and that I could make changes because I have been a professional teacher. I have been a professional teacher trainer. And I also am a trained nature guide. I could make a difference. So we have two centers, one for the prim uh, primary kids who are up to 12 and the others between 12 to 17. So when I walked in, I said, I am going to make changes. Let us expose the kids to life beyond school. And I started taking them out to the lake gardens, not to play, but to discover what there is there. Monitor lizard, birds, and so on. And I even managed to get the birding group from MNS to come and conduct a birding lesson for the bigger kids. Mm. And they fantastically enjoyed it. With the secondary kids, although I was not working in that centre, I managed to suggest ideas that could make the children more skilled. I applied to GEC, Global Environment Centre, for some funds. The director asked me to come to his office to have a discussion. And he sent, uh, uh, he, he, he said, look at these forms, apply for it now. And immediately he gave me 4,000 ringgit for two years. And that made a difference. And now when I look back, I have been in this centre for seven years. The secondary school students have managed to maintain a very high standard. And I'm sure you all know about the Echo Film Festival. They were one, their uh, video was one of the seven that was selected. And they, the GEC and the school, of course, is, is really, really uh, happy about it. And well, once they're 17, these children have to leave the organization. And seven of them managed to get jobs with Echo Nights. Okay, so mm. they are earning some money. They learned how to talk to children. They learned how to explain. They learned how to do water testing. So I am glad that in a small way, I have managed to open up their heart and eyes and understanding about how they could earn money and also help to save the environment. So Paso, so many years in education, teaching children, what do you see or have you observed any difference in today's children in regards to their understanding towards nature? Okay. Um, in the early years, there wasn't very much in the books or in the activities that could be done in school. If at all, the, the school decided to take the children for uh, overnight or, 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 or any hiking, uh, we used to get volunteer teachers. Yeah? Even among the, 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 the teachers, there would be the, uh, many who were interested. They would come. But as time went on, there, were less and, uh, there was less and less response from the staff because there was just too much paperwork. Before you go anywhere, you have to apply like three months ahead. Dozens of forms, and then the replies won't come. And then there was so much fear that should something go wrong, a child gets hurt or whatever, that they would have to be you know, dealt with you know, by the department, right? So, it was very difficult to organize, but in spite of all that, in Methodist Girls School, just six months before I retired, I worked with the physical education teacher and we decided to take 30 kids to Kinabalu. Yeah. Kinabalu Nature Park. No, to climb the mountain. Wow. 
right. 30 kids. I took it as a challenge because I was going to retire very soon. I had done a lot of things with that school, but this was something that I really wanted the children to experience. So we got, we did all the preparation. Uh, my assistant, the PJ teacher was very good. She did all the booking and because we did everything in good time, we spent like a week in Sabah. All the children managed to climb up. But one girl got altitude sickness. But somehow, because we didn't know too much about it, she was slow. Uh, rightly or wrongly, we managed to persuade her to go step by step right to the top. But coming down, she just couldn't. And then I watched the guides just lift her up and they said, we see you down there. And before we knew, they went hop, hop, hop and disappeared, leaving us, about six of us, without guides. Yeah. You know what Kinabalu Trail is like? There's no grass, there's no path, but we helped each other. We came back. We came back safely. But looking at the terrain, if we had to start early morning at two o'clock, we would never have, have, have we would never have done it. But we really had to start at two o'clock in the morning with a torchlight. We just followed the guide. We didn't know what was down there, where the ravine was, where the rope was. But thank, thankfully, we all crossed. But coming back, looking at the terrain, my God, I would have been too frightened to cross. That was the second time I climbed Kinabalu. The first time was the introduction to that place by my housemate, who was an Irish contract teacher. She opened my eyes that so many things are possible. She trained us at Batu Caves Temple. We did a lot of uh, training with bags and everything, and we went. And that was before the days that they actually had a hotel. But it is possible. I was already going to be 55 then. And I managed to bring those kids up and down safely. It is possible. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, this is our first segment of our two-part series. Um, do stay tuned, click on our subscribe button and also the no notification button so that you will be notified of the second uh, part which will be out soon. Thank you.